In 2001, Hironobu Sakaguchi and Squaresoft took a huge risk and released the animated film Final Fantasy The Spirits Within, an epic blockbuster sci-fi adventure. Evoking the iconic name of the series, it was an overly bloated and overly hyped mess. A critical and financial failure at the box office, the film nearly destroyed Squaresoft. Luckily, their success on the PlayStation 2 with Final Fantasy X, Kingdom Hearts, and their merger with Enix helped them to return to their former financial glory as Square Enix. Sakaguchi, on the other hand, took the failure personally, and due to a mixture of other factors, left Square in 2003. During this period, Microsoft was coming to terms with its own failure in Japan. They were unable to work with many of the largest players, like Square and Capcom. Rather than try to repair holes in a sinking ship, Microsoft instead aimed its sights on building a newer, stronger ship, and the initial focus of said ship was appealing to the Japanese market. Along with developing their next HD console to be smaller and sleeker, they also started trying to court various Japanese developers. They wanted premier talent to show up on launch day, and they were prepared to funnel millions and millions of dollars into this venture. Both Microsoft and Sakaguchi were looking for success after their past failures. They each needed a partner that could support their ambitions. It just so happens that they were perfect for each other at that time. Sakaguchi was starting his own studio, titled Mistwalker, and was looking for publishers to get on board. His new studio had talent from Square's golden era in the 90s, and Sakaguchi's name alone could draw in legends from across the world. On the other hand, Microsoft was developing the first HD console that would give developers more tools than ever to create lifelike graphics in larger, sprawling environments. And Microsoft had money to burn. As the legend goes, Sakaguchi and Peter Moore finalized the deal over an expensive bottle of sake. The deal was that Microsoft would help fund Mistwalker's first two games, which would be exclusive to the Xbox 360. At the time, this was an unprecedented announcement. This move showed Microsoft's aggressive attempts to break out in the Japanese market. Peter Moore spoke to Game Informer after the announcement in an interview that shows just how important Japan was as a market at the time. He refers to the country as the cradle of video games. When speaking about the deal, Moore said, By bringing the combination of well-funded development resources and, for many people, the godfather of RPGs in Sakaguchi-san together, I think that combination shows our very strong commitment to this market. This will be one of the things that, quite frankly, will determine whether we win or lose in the next generation. The first game to come from Mistwalker would be Blue Dragon, and it had a big shadow to fill. Not only was Sakaguchi the main writer on the project, but he also recruited the talents of beloved Final Fantasy composer Nobuo Uematsu to work on the soundtrack, and legendary Dragon Ball creator Akira Toriyama to design the characters and world. This would be the first time these three titans of Japanese game development had worked on a game since the beloved Chrono Trigger almost 10 years ago. Blue Dragon was also the first JRPG published by Microsoft. It was THE Xbox 360 flagship title in Japan, designed to sell consoles throughout the country. It was a technical marvel, capturing the iconic Toriyama art style in both in-engine and pre-rendered cutscenes for the HD era. The game's cutscenes were so detailed, in fact, the game required three discs to store all of them making Blue Dragon the first 360 game to include multiple discs. Suffice to say, there was a lot of hype surrounding this game before release. Not only from journalists and Japanese gamers, but also from American JRPG fans looking to play the next game from the father of Final Fantasy. These expectations would be impossible to live up to, no matter how good the game was. Almost 15 years later, and it's plain to see that Blue Dragon is not a tour de force. It didn't change video games like Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest, 
and it doesn't have the same beloved following as Chrono Trigger. It evokes the same simplicity and charm as these games, but unfortunately gets lost in the polygon counts and technological advances afforded by the 360 technology. While it does eventually find its footing, Blue Dragon is ultimately held back by its technical hurdles and overly simplistic story. The plot of Blue Dragon is as basic and generic as they come. We're thrust immediately into the action as our main party, Shu, Jiro, and Kluke, are defending their village from a land shark. We don't know anything about these characters or the village, and unfortunately we won't learn too much about them as the game goes on. After their plan nearly gets them killed, they are sucked underground and discover that the land shark is actually a giant metal creature. At the same time, they also discover a fortress helmed by Nene, an ancient being orchestrating a nefarious plot. While inside the fortress, the party is persuaded by a distant voice to eat balls of light, which give them the ability to use magic. It hurts! I'm dying! These abilities are personified by shadows representing each character's soul and appearing like an animal. After various expensive looking set piece and automatic story battles, the group attempts to make their way back home. Along the way they meet Marumaru and help heal his village. Once Marumaru joins the party, they soon run into the King of Gibral and his right hand warrior Zola. It's discovered that Nene is in fact behind everything that's going wrong in the world. The Kingdom of Gibral has been fighting against Nene's magic and needs help stopping him from terrorizing everyone and everything. Now the party, including Zola, must journey to set the world right and defeat Nene before he destroys everyone and everything for seemingly his own amusement. What I just described there is the entirety of the first disc of Blue Dragon. As you can see, the plot is as thin as they come. Starting with an action set piece is par for the course for Sakaguchi, like the iconic reactor mission in Final Fantasy VII, or the extremely effective opera heist in Final Fantasy IX. Yet, here, it's just not as strong. While exciting and lavish, the opening action scene isn't as effective because there's nothing to ground us afterwards. There's no returning to Tifa's bar to sort of get to know the characters or the subway ride home. We never get enough time in general to spend with the characters and get to know them. The first disc moves at a near breakneck pace, moving from town to town, expensive cutscene to impressive spectacle. The game rarely slows down or offers longer moments of calm. The characters never get a chance to just hang out. And whenever they do, the story is trying to jam as much character details as possible. Cutscenes between the party are personal exposition dumps that overload the player with information about a person's life, hopes and dreams, etc. Yet the information provided is still paper thin at best. Shu is a hothead, Jiro is intelligently reserved, and Kluke is a girl. With dead parents. I know this because these defining character traits are never challenged or elaborated on, just repeated ad nauseum throughout the entire adventure. Marumaru has some personal struggles when we first meet him, as he has to protect his family from a deadly disease, taking responsibility for the first time in his life. But once that quest is resolved, he regresses back to an annoying, screaming child. It was only Moro's village that was saved, so everything isn't okay! Take Moro too! Would you stop <laughs> screaming in my ear? Zola does have a character arc, but it's only revealed in the literal last hour of the game, so it barely has an impact. Her character growth isn't present for the 30 or so hours she's in your party. The lack of engaging characters and story were my biggest hurdle when finding the motivation to play Blue Dragon. Despite the fast pace of the narrative, the aimlessness in the beginning makes the game feel so incredibly slow. I feel like the goal in making the narrative so simple was to return to a classic style of storytelling, with characters who were basic but distinct. In older JRPGs like Chrono Trigger or Dragon Quest, the characters may not have complex stories or drastically change by the end, but they're likable and leave an impression long after the game is over. 
Blue Dragon, I believe, is aiming for that same accessible simplicity. In reality, I found it difficult to truly connect with anyone. Everyone's archetypes are so tight and their interactions so sparse, it's hard to get a sense that they were actually friends bound together by a quest to defeat evil. In between the major story beats are side stories in each town you visit. Pretty standard JRPG pacing. Perfect time to develop the world and characters, you would think. The individual stories in each town are mildly engaging at first, but they become predictable and tedious towards the end of the second disc, which is nearly 30 hours into the game. Each plotline follows a similar formula of something going wrong in the village, the party investigates and is told they have to defeat some monster or explore some place, and then they do. Rarely do these mini plots evolve past this formula, and rarely do the villages have a personality beyond the problems they're facing. I remember the scenarios and the bosses I fought, but not the people I talked to or the style and character of the village. These village plots rarely offer us insight into the main characters, or really tie back into the overall narrative. They're entirely separate from the narrative most of the time. Part of the issue with the story stems from the presentation through cutscenes and dialogue. <gasps> what are they wearing? Oftentimes, it feels like cutscenes are less concerned with what the characters are saying and more concerned with showing off the next-gen tech of the Xbox 360. Many of the pre-rendered cutscenes are filled to the brim with impressive effects, thousands upon thousands of characters, and exciting dynamic action. These pre-rendered scenes are admittedly still impressive nearly 15 years later. Unfortunately, this focus takes precedence away from the in-engine cutscenes, which are much less exciting. Most of the time, the characters are just standing around awkwardly talking to each other about what to do next. They're incredibly static, not just in terms of character action, but in terms of the camera framing and cinematography. I played with the English dub, and despite having Microsoft money to back it and over a year of work put into it, it's a pretty stale translation, only making the boring cinematography more noticeable. The dialogue is simplistic, due not only to the focus on exposition, but also on the lack of character in the way everyone speaks. The jokes aren't funny, the things people say are rarely engaging, and there's just no personality in what is said or how it is being said. This is especially true of the NPC characters. After something like Enchanted Arms, where almost every person you talk to seemed to have a life of their own, I was hoping we could get a similar experience here. While every NPC looks like they were ripped straight from a Toriyama art book, they rarely have the personality to match. Oftentimes they exist to simply say a one-liner or repeat the information you already know. And in Blue Dragon, there are more NPCs than in the previous generation of JRPGs. As a holdover from the old school model, the game encourages you to explore each town and talk to everyone. While this was fairly manageable in, say, the older Final Fantasies or Dragon Quests, here most NPCs have nothing to say, making this engagement feel like a chore, especially since there's such a larger density of them. Even in something like Dragon Quest, which Blue Dragon is clearly trying to emulate, the NPCs have some cute dialogue or will comment on your characters in interesting ways. Here, most of the dialogue is one to two sentences of nebulous, forgetful info. Exploring the towns makes Blue Dragon feel lifeless. Accompanying the beautiful graphics but flat characters is the gorgeous score from the legendary Nobuo Uematsu. While not as iconic as his Final Fantasy efforts, the music is still memorable. From the nostalgically quiet menu music, the epic world map theme, or the fun battle theme. It's hard not to fall in love with the soundtrack. The standout, for better or worse, is the boss battle theme.
as sung by Ian Gillian, lead singer of British rock band Deep Purple, and with lyrics written by Sakaguchi, Eternity is a cheesy hair metal song planted in the middle of this fantasy JRPG. While at first off-putting, it soon becomes a key part of the experience. Its ridiculous lyrics screamed by an aging rock star endlessly looped during the drawn-out boss fights. The song ends up living up to its title, joyously so. The lack of creativity in the dialogue, story, and characters is a shame because as Uematsu's score shows, the world design and monster design promises a more interesting and weird game. Toriyama's art style is instantly recognizable, and he already has experience designing JRPG characters in Dragon Quest and Chrono Trigger. Here he's allowed to go a little bit crazier and design some truly inspired bosses and enemies. Instead of slimes, we have poo snakes. There are also multiple types of ghosts, distinctive robots, and even dinosaurs. The creativity also extends to enemy battle animation, which is always fun and distinct. Every enemy has some sort of unique animation or attack that gives them an instantly recognizable personality. Part of the fun of exploring the world map is just seeing what enemies you'll encounter, or what crazy boss will show up next. These distinct animations also help with Blue Dragon's most fascinating game mechanic which is the monster fights. This mechanic occurs whenever you fight two enemies who are natural rivals. When you start the fight, these monsters fight amongst themselves while you get to clean up the scraps. It's a fun mechanic that feels truly next-gen, since it requires multiple technological advances to work. You need to be able to see enemies clearly on the map, be able to fight multiple enemies on screen at once, and have them able to interact with each other. It's another burst of creativity that impresses even today. The boss fights are also a nice change of pace. Their designs are expressive and intricate, serving as nice rewards for suffering through each dungeon. These fights also have unique interactions not seen in other battles. You'll need to weaken the boss with specific moves, plan around debilitating status ailments, and adjust to timing shifts. The in-game bosses are especially challenging and require some unique solutions not seen in normal combat. Clearly, a lot of the time and effort went into the monster designs and animation, which makes sense as you'll be spending the majority of your time in these battles. <laughs> The battle system in Blue Dragon is a great idea on paper and, thankfully, often in practice. Fights are turn-based but rely on strategic timing. Similar to a golf game, coincidentally, you build the power and timing of your attack by hitting a meter at just the right time. It creates some interesting situations where you have to understand what your enemy is capable of, how powerful your attacks need to be, and just how many turns are you able to waste for a powerful move. These decisions are made more interesting thanks to the class system. There are 9 classes total that level up with their own points called SP. Each class offers specific stat buffs and moves which can be mixed and matched once you've learned them. So, for example, you can have a magic sword with monk abilities to raise their attack power while using a passive black magic skill to restore MP after each fight. While most of my party fell into fairly standard roles by the end, it was still fun and easy to try on different hats. New classes unlock every 10 levels, and by the end of the game you'll be earning SP left and right. A huge part of the fun of the endgame grind is getting your party overpowered thanks to a plethora of abilities, so it makes sense that you can build it so easily at this point in the game. Despite these positives, the battle system has one major flaw. Frame rate slowdown. Due to the fact that you have to charge the abilities for almost every class, most of your party will at some point charge their shadows to attack. This action is represented by your shadow appearing and building their power. Now, you have another model on screen with moving particle effects. Apparently, the Xbox 360 can't handle all these graphical elements on screen. While Blue Dragon should run at a steady 30 frames per second, it often dips down to below 20, seemingly even to 10 in more intense attack animations. This means that every attack, every power build, and every enemy counter takes more time due to the frame rate slowdown. While probably impressive for the time, every detailed attack animation drags out even the simplest of fights into unbearable slogs. 
Easy battles that should take 20 to 40 seconds tops get dragged out into one or two minute waiting matches, and that time adds up. Almost every dungeon takes over an hour to complete simply because you're waiting for each overdone animation to finish before you can even select your next move. On top of the already barebones story and slow pace in the first disc, it became very difficult to sit through these fights. I found myself avoiding building up my attacks just so I could maintain a steadyish frame rate. Even worse, I was less motivated to explore the world since it meant I'd have to subject myself to more fights. I actively wanted to avoid exploring and fighting enemies in a JRPG. In this instance, the technology actively hurts the core game mechanics. These technological issues confused me. Since I thought Blue Dragon was designed for the Xbox 360, how could your graphical showcase barely run on the machine it's designed for? The answer lies in the difficult move to the HD generation. Sakaguchi has not been shy about talking about his and his team's frustrations with Unreal Engine 3 and working with Microsoft on development. The main issue he cites is a lack of communication. Being relatively new, Unreal Engine 3 was constantly updating during development, so while updates kept rolling out, Mistwalker's mainly Japanese team could not read the updates since they were only in English. Worst of all, by the time the manuals were translated and understood, they were obsolete as a new update would have rolled out by then. It seems as if the team was actively fighting with the engine to make the game run, and unfortunately it shows, creating a less cohesive and less enjoyable experience. I know I've been pretty down on Blue Dragon so far, and that's because I genuinely did not enjoy it most of the time I played it. It rarely inspired any emotions in me other than boredom or indifference. The first two discs truly are a slog to get through, as the story is basically aimless. The characters have mildly clear goals, and the gameplay has yet to fully come into its own. It was a struggle to play Blue Dragon. That is, until I reached the third disc, 30 hours into the adventure. At the beginning of the third disc, the party has reached the lowest point of the story, separated and seemingly powerless. After some literal soul searching and a regrouping effort, the real game reveals itself. At this point, you are given an airship and multiple points on the map to explore. While you have the choice to enter the hole in the ground and begin the final dungeon a la Final Fantasy VII, you will most likely be severely unprepared. You have multiple clear goals that you can tackle in any order, and you have new abilities that make exploration easier. This open-ended structure is where Blue Dragon finally comes into its own. The characters and story take a back seat in favor of allowing the player to pick and choose their next destination. No story, no overly long cutscenes, just battling and exploring using powerful abilities. The fights are still plagued by severe slowdown, even more so now that the enemies have to be more impressive since we're in the endgame. But the gameplay itself, the tactical timing and joy of seeing your stats slowly rise, the exploration of dungeons and finding new bosses, all of that finally became fun. Maybe it was because my party's classes allowed for more freedom in choosing skills. Maybe it was because I was near the end and wanted to be over with this game. Or maybe it was some inherent Stockholm Syndrome. But either way, I was finally having fun. While I didn't end up doing everything, like fighting the multiple weapon style endgame bosses to test your skills, I did have fun finding powerful items and testing my mix and match skills against new enemies. I found joy in playing an old school JRPG. It's the same inherent joy one feels playing an older game like Dragon Quest, or the streamlined grinding in Brutally Default, or leveling up in the granddaddy of RPGs Dungeons and Dragons. This was the fun of getting stronger, and Blue Dragon is ultimately all about the fun of getting stronger. In an interview with Kikazo, Sakaguchi is asked about the gameplay, specifically about the purpose of the shadows. He responds by saying, Just like elements in Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy, these shadows have a particular purpose. Through the shadows, you obtain different skills, 
then combine those skills and tricks and use them. In essence, it's not all about strategy, but about powering up as you move through the game, the character grows. It's true that the shadows are an important part of the narrative, even if the story and characters are as transparent as the shadows. One of the main themes of the story is change, about people growing with the times, powering up their inner selves. The main party is at their lowest point when Nene takes away their shadows, where it's revealed that he gave them the ability to use magic but Chu and friends gain their magic shadows back by facing themselves and overcoming their emotions. It's a pretty obvious metaphor, but is one of the few moments of depth and introspection in the entire game. It's no surprise that it happens at the beginning of the third disc. The party grows stronger by confronting, understanding, and controlling their inner souls. They power up, so to speak. While this theme isn't explored in depth, I could see it resonating with the younger audience. Yet, the heroes aren't the only ones who reconcile with change. A common theme in Sakaguchi's work is the fear of technology. And Blue Dragon is no different, yet it offers an interesting new spin here. The villainous Nene is afraid of change and growing old, but his traditional world is one of machines and technology of biological weapons and war. In Blue Dragon's world, these ancient technologies are referred to as magic. To the characters, this magic is hundreds of years old, only existing as murals in a forgotten city or as stories told to children. To the player, this is future tech beyond our wildest dreams, and paradoxically, the term magic refers to ancient technology in our own fiction. We share the same disbelief the characters feel whenever they encounter it, but for different reasons. Most stories of fear in technology come from a place of fearing rapid change, of moving away from traditionalism. In the world of Blue Dragon, traditionalism is our version of futurism, yet it uses the same terminology as our traditionalism. For the in-game narrative, the story is about rejecting traditionalism and embracing change. Rejecting the old ways of magic and embracing a new way of using it. For the player, this is a subversion of the fear of technology theme, since traditional is future tech, and the change is a return to nature, to what we would consider traditional. There is also an element of classism in Nene's plan to rule the world with his traditional values. He believes that since he is an ancient being, that he has an inherent intelligence and superiority to rule the world. He argues that people will be free once he takes over, yet he punishes anyone that won't blindly follow his gift of freedom. Just as the in-game society clashes between traditional technology and modern agricultural lifestyles, so too does the planet, as it literally splits in half to reveal a world of floating cubes created by magic inside the planet's core. To Nene, this is paradise, as its traditional magic is what he's been striving for. To everyone else, it's incomprehensible, foreign, and dangerous. The harmful ideology that Nene practices is not traditionalism in itself, but more the forceful nature of it. It's the principle that one is better than others because they prefer traditional methods, or at least are knowledgeable of them. Shu and friends help others no matter their creed or status. They see the good in people and stand up for the little person. Despite Shu's strong-headed nature, the party often asks questions where most people don't. Or at least they do when the plot calls for it. Other times, Shu or Marumaru run headfirst when they really shouldn't. What's this? Don't touch that!
The themes in Blue Dragon are interesting to explore and the world is built around them, as seen with the shadow mechanic. But everything else is so inconsistent. The major themes don't reveal themselves until the end, and it's difficult for me to think of major plot lines or character choices that relate to these themes outside of the third disc. The journey is mostly aimless and automatic. Flashy action and beautiful art take hold over character development and intrigue. This is a human story devoid of humanity. And that's what makes my lukewarm reception to Blue Dragon so disappointing. The presentation and the world building are phenomenal. Clearly a lot of love and passion went into creating this world. I would love to see more adventures within this universe. So much so that I've genuinely considered picking up the two sequels on the Nintendo DS. Both of which ditch the turn-based RPG combat for their own strategy and action RPG gameplay respectfully. This is a great launch pad for more, and clearly Mistwalker felt the same. A direct sequel on the Xbox was apparently in the works before news stopped coming out about it, and an anime series aired internationally, along with the DS sequels which proved that there was at least some interest in expanding the franchise. I'm not sure if Blue Dragon ever had a chance to reach the same heights as its inspirations, like Dragon Quest and Chrono Trigger, but I do think the passion behind this beautiful looking game is palpable during combat. I just wish there was more effort put into the characters and story. The flat storytelling mixed with the tedious fights make Blue Dragon difficult to play on the Xbox 360. Luckily, most modern players don't have to resort to this now old technology. Thanks to Microsoft's continued support of backwards compatibility, you can now play Blue Dragon on the latest Xbox consoles with enhanced visuals and a seemingly stable frame rate. I believe that if I owned an Xbox One or a series brand console, I would have had a much more enjoyable time with the game. If you are interested in this release, I do think that the definitive way to play is on the latest Xbox hardware, where the game can finally show off the potential of the Xbox 360, over a decade after its relevance. It's somewhat fitting that the villain of Blue Dragon is obsessed with technology. That same obsession with the advancement in tech is the ultimate downfall of Blue Dragon's development. Yet the game also yearns to return to an older style of JRPG, attempting to use the new graphics and processing power to expand on this traditional formula. While the graphical power and grand scale gets in the way of the story and gameplay, there is an inherent charm to capturing Toriyama's art style and the genuine simplicity of it all. Maybe that's why the reception to the game has been mostly positive since its release. Many people can look past these performance issues and basic story elements, and embrace the colorful world and the nostalgic feeling of leveling up a party of friends. It may not entirely be for me, but I do believe it is an adventure worth exploring. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I know this video took a little bit longer than normal to get out. Um, as I said, it was hard to find the motivation to work on this, but once I got on a roll, it became a lot easier. Um, but I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this all the way to the end. Um, and I'm really excited for the next video where we'll be talking about Eternal Sonata, which is one of the few um, JRPGs on the Xbox 360 that I actually have a personal connection to. So very excited to, to work on that. Um, but also, I'm really curious what your thoughts were on those on Blue Dragon. You know, do you have your own experiences playing it? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Um, and if you want to see more of my reviews on the Xbox 360 JRPGs, or you're interested in my film reviews, uh, please consider subscribing or liking the video to show your support. Uh, but either way, thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you next time.